section 11.2, series. In general, if we try to add the terms of an infinite sequence, we get an expression of the form a1 plus a2 plus a3 and so on, which is called an infinite series, or just a series, and is denoted for short using the symbols uh, sigma. So something like this or something like this. Notice the big differences between um, series and uh, sequences the notation. We use curly braces for sequences. And for sequences, we use commas in between each of the terms because we're just looking at one term after the next. Whereas for a series, we add up all the terms. So adding up an infinite number of terms kind of doesn't make sense at the moment. So instead, how about we take a series and we add up a finite number of terms called a partial sum. So this means that we cut our sum off somewhere, let's say n. Notice for this infinite series, after n, it kept going. Whereas over here for this finite sum, we stop after some term a n. So instead of going to infinity, we stop at term number n. So we call that partial sum Sn, and that partial sum Sn is for the nth term that we stop at. So if we stop at the first term and just add up just one term, not adding anything else, then that's just S1. If we add the first two terms, it's S2. Add the first three terms, it's S3. So we can make a sequence out of all those sums depending on where we stop at, and that new sequence is what will determine whether the original series converges or diverges, whether we can add up all those terms or not. So we take the limit of the sequence of those partial sums. We say that if that equals some number s, then the sum of the series equals s. So uh, if the sequence is divergent, then the series is divergent. Let's do an example by finding the sum of the series a n if the first n terms of the series, the sum of the first n terms of the series is given by 2n over 3n plus 5. So that means that if we want the sum of the first two terms, we just plug in n equals 2. If we want the sum of the first 10 terms, we plug in n equals 10. This sum sequence over here is not the same as this a n over here. The sum of the series is going to be a totally um, different sequence than, this, than the sequence being added up in the series. So we don't even need to know what the actual um, series was in order to find its sum as if we are provided a formula for the partial sum like this. So by definition, our sum of our series from 1 to infinity of a n will be the limit of all of these partial sums, which means it's the limit of the sequence for partial sums, 2n over 3n plus 5. And that's going to be the limit of just uh, 2 over 3 plus 5 over n, because we divide the numerator and denominator by n. And then limit of 2 is 2, limit of 3 is 3, limit of 5 over n is just 0 because n is becoming arbitrarily large. So we get 2 thirds. Let's try to find the sum of the geometric series where notice each term is being multiplied by some common ratio r. So we start with a, then ar, then ar squared, ar cubed, and so on. We keep going even past ar times n minus 1, just infinitely, just keep multiplying by more and more r's. So how about we investigate the sum of the series for different values of r. Notice we cannot just take the limit of ar to the n minus 1, because that would just be the limit of the sequence, whereas we want the sum, which means that we need to take a whole bunch of partial sums and then find the limit of that sequence. We're not just looking at the limit of a bunch of things with commas, which is what would be if we just took the limit of ar to the n minus 1. We want the limit of, let's say, a sequence of the first two being added, then the second, then the first three being added, then the first four being added, and so on. That's the partial sums. 
So let's see if we can come up with a formula for our partial sum sequence Sn, which was not given to us this time. So if r equals 1, then that means that our partial sums Sn would be a plus a times r is just 1, so just a again, and they're all just going to be a. And we stop somewhere because this is a partial sum stopping at n, it's finite. So that means that we're stopping after we get n of these a's. So there's n terms over here. If we had two a's, it would be two a, three a's would be three a. Since we have n a's, it's n a. And if n is going to infinity, then this is either going to plus infinity if a is positive or minus infinity if a is negative. So since the partial sum sequence diverges, that means that our series diverges. So we can't add up the geometric series for r equals 1. How about r equals uh, something else? How about r is not equal to 1? Well, if r is not equal to 1, then we'll write our partial sums as a plus a r plus a r squared and so on. But we have to stop somewhere because this is a partial sum so it's finite. So we'll stop at um, the nth term which is a r to the n minus 1 over here. Notice we do not keep going. So we stop over here at a r to the n minus 1 unlike in our series which is infinite. The partial sums are finite. So now try to find a formula for a general term in our uh, partial sum sequence. How about we multiply everything by r? So we get the first term is a times r, so that's just a r. The second term is this a r times r, so that's a r squared now. So it looks like we get back every other term except for the first one. and we'll have an additional term at the end because this one at the end also gets multiplied by r. So adding one more r there, we get a r to the n. So now what we can do is we can take this thing, sn, and we can subtract r sn from it and we'll cancel out all of these guys, right? So we'll just take sn minus r sn and all we'll have left after canceling everything is just the a at the beginning and then minus this last term. So minus a r to the n. So now we solve for sn. We can factor out sn over here. We get 1 minus r and then divide by that. So we get that sn is equal to a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So now we have a formula for our uh, partial sum sequence. So we just have to figure out whether this thing converges or diverges. Well, we know something about r to the n. In the previous section, in uh, example 9, we took a look at the um, convergence or divergence of the sequence r to the n. So we said that if r is between minus 1 and 1, then r to the n went to 0 as n went to infinity. So that means that our limit of sn, which is equal to the limit of a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r, must be equal to, well we could split it into a over 1 minus r minus a over 1 minus r times the limit of r to the n. Notice that everything else in terms of our limit is considered a constant because there's no n's there. There's only an n in the r to the n term, so everything else can be taken outside of the limit. So the first term is just a over 1 minus r. And the second term, well this limit is 0. 
So the entire thing over here is just zero. So our limit is a over one minus r, provided that r is between one and minus one. Uh, so this means that we have our sum. If n equals one, from n equals one to infinity of a r to the n minus one, that must just be a over one minus r whenever r is between minus one and one or whenever the absolute value of r is less than one. Notice if r equals one, we already saw that the sum diverges because it just gets arbitrarily large. And if we look at r to the n, that sequence, well, that actually converged for r equals one. So we had to be super careful over here because remember this didn't apply if r equals one because our denominator would be undefined. So we had to investigate that case separately. It didn't match up with um, the r to the n sequence that we looked at before. So it looks like this sum is going to diverge otherwise because r to the n diverged otherwise. So this formula is pretty important and it only works when the absolute value of r is less than 1. Otherwise the geometric series will diverge. We'll use it quite often, a over 1 minus r. We'll also use the uh, partial sum formula too. Let's find uh, some of this geometric series. Well in this case our first term is a and that's 5. Our common ratio looks like 5 is being multiplied by negative 2 thirds and every other term is being multiplied by negative 2 thirds so r is negative 2 thirds. Our absolute value of r is 2 thirds which is smaller than 1 so we can actually add this up. So this implies that 5 minus 10 thirds plus 20 over 9 minus 40 over 27, adding up, uh, well, should have a plus sign, just keeps going. That's going to equal a over 1 minus r, which is 5 over 1 minus minus 2 thirds, which is 5 over 5 thirds, which is 3. Okay, let's take a look at this series. 2 to the 2n, 3 to the 1 minus n. Is it convergent or divergent? Well, how about we try to rewrite it as a geometric series and see if we can. We've got uh, 2 to the 2n times 3 to the 1 minus n. And that's equal to the sum of 2 squared to the n. Trying to write everything with just one n. And this will be 3 to the minus n minus 1. And I do that so that I can write our series as 4 to the n. Right, 2 squared is 4 over 3 to the n minus 1. Because now I could just uh, pull out one of the 4s. So I get that this is sum of uh, 4. And now the top is just 4 to the n minus 1. So I have 4 to the n minus 1 in the numerator and the denominator. So I can pull out the n minus 1. Perfect, so that's geometric. A must be 4. R is 4 thirds. R is greater than 1. So that means that this sum must diverge. The entire idea behind convergent and divergent series is that if a series converges, then when you look at the sequence of partial sums, it levels off somewhere. It's almost like you're not adding anything anymore. Whereas when it diverges, you just keep adding too much and it never levels off. A drug is administered to a patient at the same time every day.
Suppose the concentration of the drug is CN, measured in milligrams per milliliter, after the injection on the nth day. Before the injection the next day, only 30% of the drug remains in the bloodstream, and the daily dose raises the concentration by 0.2 milligrams per milliliter. Let's find the concentration after three days. So it looks like the concentration the next day, CN plus one, is equal to uh, 0.3 times the concentration the previous day, and then it gets raised by 0.2. So it's just gonna be 0.2 plus 0 0.3, 30% times the previous amount remaining in the bloodstream. I mean, that, that's, that's how much remains in the bloodstream, the previous concentration times 0 0.3, and then it just goes up by 0.2. So we have a recursive formula. We're gonna to try to get an explicit one. So we've got our first day, C0. Well, we're starting with no concentration, so that's zero. So then C1. Well, we take 0.2, we add that to 0.3 times C0, which is 0, and we just get 0.2. Then for C2, we take 0.2, we add that to 0.3 times the previous concentration, which was C1. We get 0.2 plus 0.2 times 0.3. And I'm writing the point 0.2 out in front because I'm trying to show you guys the pattern. This ends up becoming 0 0.26. If you write it out with C3, then we have 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3 times C2, which is 0 0.2 plus 0 0.2 times 0 0.3. Because what I'm doing is I'm taking this and I'm multiplying it by 0 0.3. So first the 0.2 gets multiplied by 0.3, and then the 0.2 times 0.3 gets multiplied by 0.3. So that's the same as 0.3 squared. And that's 0.278. So this means that there's gonna be 0.278 milligrams per milliliter uh, as the concentration after three days. But notice we kind of identified a pattern over here. So we should now be able to find the concentration after the nth dose. Notice that the sequence is going 0 0.2, 0 0.2 times 0 0.3, 0 0.2 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.3, etc. So it seems like in general, Cn should be equal to 0 0.2 plus 0.2 times 0.3 plus 0.2 times 0.3 squared and so on, where nth term is 0 0.2 times 0.3 to the n minus one. So that's where we stop for Cn. So this looks like a geometric series with a equals 0 0.2 and r equals 0 0.3. So that means that Cn has the concentration well, after the nth dose, that's the partial sum of the geometric series. Remember, the partial sum was what we got before we took the limit, which was a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So that's 0 0.2 times 1 minus 0 0.3 to the n over 1 minus 0.3. We don't have to uh, worry about the value of r for our partial sum because it's finite, but uh, it's nice to know that it's less than one so that when we look at the limiting concentration, we'll be actually able to add up our geometric series. So this ends up becoming 2 sevenths times 1 minus 0 0.3 to the n milligrams per milliliter as the concentration after the nth dose. So to find the limiting concentration, Fortunately, r is less than one, so this thing will actually exist, and it'll just be the sum of the geometric series. So it's the limit of two sevenths times one minus 0.3 to the n, which is two sevenths times one minus zero, because 0.3 to the n goes to zero because r is less than one.
So that's just two sevenths. Let's try to write the number 2.317 bar, where the 1 sevens repeat forever as a ratio of integers. So let's try to rewrite this as a series. We've got 2.31717171. Seven, one, seven, one, seven, and so on. And that's just 2.3 if we pull that out, plus 17 thousandths, so that's 17 over 10 to the third. It's in that third spot. And then the next 17 is over 10 to the fifth, because it's in the fifth spot. And the next 17 is over 10 to the seventh, and so on. So this is a geometric series, or just this part, not the 2.3, but we don't have to worry about that. We can always add that later. So we'll look at a equals 17 over 10 to the third, because that's our first term. And it looks like each term is being multiplied by 1 over 10 squared. So that's our common ratio, r. So we have 2.317 bar equal to 2.3 plus uh, the sum of this geometric series, which is a over 1 minus r, because r is less than 1. So we have a, which is 17 over 10 cubed, over 1 minus r, which is 1 minus 1 tenth squared. 1 over 10 squared, same thing. So that's 2.3 plus 17 over 1,000 over 99 over 100 and that's just 23 over 10 plus 17 over 990 which is 1147 over 495 How about the sum of the series x to the n, where the absolute value of x is less than 1? We have a, a convention where we say that x to 0 is 1, even if x equals 0, which is unusual, because usually we say 0 to 0 is uh, undefined. But for series, we just say x to 0 is 1, regardless of what x is. So that means that our series becomes the sum of 1 for x to the 0 plus x to the 1 which is x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4th and so on. So that's geometric. a is 1, r is x. We have that the absolute value of r is the absolute value of x which they told us was less than 1 so that we can actually add this up. So that means that we get that the sum of uh, x to the n is a over 1 minus r, so that's 1 over 1 minus x. Let's now show that the series 1 over n times n plus 1 is convergent and find its sum. So let's look at the partial sums. We've got sn equal to the partial sum, so we'll stop at n. So we have to use another index i, and it'll be 1 over i times i plus 1. So expanding that out, we get it's 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4, and so on, until we get to the nth term we stop at for our partial sum, which would just be 1 over n times n plus 1. So notice that we couldn't use our geometric series formula in this case because the series is not geometric. So we're investigating the partial sums. We're going to try to find some formula for the sequence of partial sums.
So in order to do that, let's take a look at 1 over i times i plus 1. We could hopefully use some partial fractions here to split this into some coefficient a over i plus some other coefficient b over i plus 1. Multiplying through by the denominator i times i plus 1, we get that 1 is equal to a times i plus 1 plus b times i. And then if we set some convenient values of i, we could solve for a and b. So how about we put i equals 0. Then we get 1 equals a times 1, so a is just 1. So we have 1 over i times i plus 1 equal to 1 over i. And then to solve for b, we just put minus 1 in for i. Then that kills this term off, and we just get 1 equals minus b. So b is minus 1, so instead of a plus, I'll put a minus. And I'll just write 1 over i plus 1. So this means that Sn is equal to the sum of 1 over i times i plus 1. And we can rewrite that as the sum of 1 over i minus 1 over i plus 1. So let's write out a couple terms over here. We get 1 minus a half for, an equal, for i equals 1. And then we add that to a half minus a third for i equals 2. And then we add that to a third minus a fourth and so on until we're adding 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. So notice if I look at the halves, minus 1 half cancels with plus 1 half. And if I look at the um, thirds, I get that 1 third cancels with uh, minus one third, or minus one third cancels with one third. And I can keep going like this. The minus one fourth will cancel with the one fourth that's not over here. The one over n will cancel with the minus one over n that I didn't write. So it looks like the only terms left will be the one at the beginning and the minus one over n plus one at the end. So our Sn equals 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. And that's a form that we can actually take the limit of. So now we can take the limit of our sequence of partial sums and see that just the limit of 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. Limit of 1 is 1. Limit of 1 over n is the same as 1 over n plus 1, so that's 0. So this thing is just 1. So that means that our series adds up to 1. So we could say 1 over n times n plus 1. The series is 1. If you were to take a look at a graph of this, let's say here is m and we'll put 1 over here. So then here we're starting at our first uh, value, which was just 1 over 1 times 2. So that's just a half plus, all right, so just that 1 half. And then we keep going up for our sum. But the sum never actually passes 1. It kind of levels off around 1 something like that. So this is Sn, so it should make sense that our sum levels off at 1, and that's why our sum has a value of 1. However, if we look at the sequence, how about I use uh, another color for that? So the underlying sequence, 1 over n times n plus 1, without the sigma, without the sum, well, it, that's just, you just took the limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of this well, that's just zero.
you have the limit of 1 over n times the limit of 1 over n plus 1 is 0 times 0. So that looks something like this. where it just levels off around zero. So this would be a n. So notice they both have the same starting point, but because you don't add the terms, a n doesn't go up. You're just looking at the next term, which is just a fraction with an even bigger denominator, so it goes down. Whereas s n, you're adding every term, so the s n just you know goes up, and it doesn't explode, but it still you know goes up. So you have to be very careful when evaluating infinite series that you don't just blindly take the limit of the sequence inside of the series. Because if you do that, you'll just have the limit of a sequence. You need the limit of the partial sums of the series, which is a totally dis uh, set distinct sequence. So the sequence, sorry, the series, 1 over n, where n goes from 1 to infinity, is called the harmonic series. It's very famous. It's 1 plus a half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth and so on. Let's show that it diverges. So there's tons of different uh, methods of showing that this series diverges. What we're going to do is take advantage of the fact that the partial sums tend to follow a pattern if you go by powers of 2. So what I mean is take a look at S2, the sum after two terms. That's just 1 plus a half then take a look at the sum after four terms. That's one plus a half plus one third plus one fourth. I'm putting that in parentheses because I want to show that this is going to be greater than one plus a half plus a fourth plus a fourth because a fourth is uh, smaller than one third. But a fourth plus a fourth is a half, so this is really just equal to one plus a half plus a half, which I'll write as two over two to preserve the pattern. So let's take a look at S8. That'll be one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus one fifth plus one sixth plus one seventh plus one eighth and that'll be greater than one plus one half plus a fourth plus a fourth as before and this time for the other terms I want them to also add up to a half so I'll make them all one eighth because one fifth plus one sixth plus one seventh those are all bigger than one eighth So this means that S8 is going to be greater than 1 plus 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half, which is 1 plus 3 over 2. And now you might be able to see why I wrote it as 2 over 2, because you can already kind of anticipate that uh, S16, which I can write as 1 plus 1 half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth through to one eighth plus one ninth through to one sixteenth will end up being greater than one plus one half plus one fourth plus one fourth plus one eighth and so on to one eighth plus one sixteenth and so on to one sixteenth which is equal to one plus one half plus one half plus one half plus one half which is one plus four over two Similarly, we can say that S32, or we can show that it will be greater than 1 plus 5 over 2, but I won't write it out. For S64, uh, the sum of the first 64 terms in our partial sum, that'll be greater than 1 plus 6 over 2. 
So in general, we could say that the sum of the first two to the n terms, powers of two, will be one plus n over two. So this implies that the sum of the two, uh, first two to the n terms goes to infinity as n tends to infinity. Because this just blows up. It's always going to be bigger than this. So the sum is not leveling off. So our sum is divergent. So our sequence of partial sums is divergent. And therefore the harmonic series is divergent. For our next theorem, if the series uh, sum of an is convergent, then the limit of the sequence inside of the series must be zero, which is kind of helpful. So to prove this, let's let sn be our sequence of partial sums. And an, well, if I want to solve for that, I could just take sn and I could subtract everything before an. So that's a1 through the previous term over here, which is an minus 1. So this entire sum over here is just sn minus 1. It's just the partial sum stopping 1 before. So that means that an by itself must equal sn minus sn minus 1. We have the sum of an being convergent because we're assuming that if the series is convergent, we want to show the limit is 0. So we have the sum convergent. So that means that sn must be convergent. So that means it has some limit s. So how about you let uh, the limit of sn be s, and then n minus 1 also goes to infinity as n tends to infinity, so that means the limit of sn minus 1 is also s. So we have the limit of a n equals the limit of sn minus sn minus 1. We can split the limits, get the limit of sn minus the limit of sn minus 1. Both of these guys are s. So we just get s minus s, which is 0. So if we have a series of uh, some sequence, the limit of the sequence inside the series must be zero. That doesn't mean the sum is zero. It just means the limit of the sequence must be zero. So we get an immediate corollary, which is a test for divergence. This is also called the uh, nth term test, and it's got a few other names too, but depends what book you read. So our test for divergence says that if the limit doesn't exist, or if the limit is not zero for the sequence inside of a series, then the series itself must diverge. Remember that the converse is not necessarily true for this uh, theorem over here, because if we look back to the harmonic series, we had a uh, series where the sequence was zero, but the series still diverged. So having the sequence have a limit of zero is not enough to know if the series converges or diverges. However, if the series does happen to converge, then the limit would have to be zero. So that means that if you run across a series where the limit is not zero, then that will automatically disqualify it from converging. That's just the contrapositive of our theorem. So converses are not necessarily true, but contrapositives always have the same truth value. So if you want to prove this, you can just um, assume that the series is not divergent, so then it must be convergent, so that means that the limit is zero by the previous theorem, and then you immediately get the result by contrapositive. So we can quickly show now that a series like this diverges, because all we have to do is take the limit. So we'll take the limit of the sequence inside the series. So that's just going to be the limit of n squared over 5n squared plus 4, which is the limit of 1 over 5 plus 4 over n squared, where we just divide everything by n squared. So that's 1 fifth. 1 fifth is not 0. So that means that our series diverges by the test for divergence, or the uh, nth term test.
So we just have a few uh, properties of series now. If we have two convergent series, then the series where we multiply it by a constant is also convergent. So are the sums and so are the differences. So what we can do is we can pull out that constant if it's there because the uh, series doesn't depend on it. So our limit of partial sums doesn't depend on it. There's no n in that constant. We can also separate it just because we can separate um, limits of the uh, partial sums, just like we can separate limits of the differences of them. So these all just follow by uh, limit laws for sequences, which in turn follow by limit laws for just limits in general. How about we uh, use these laws to find the sum of this series over here using stuff we already know. So it seems like this guy over here is a geometric series with a equals one half and r equals one half. So I'll, I'll, I'll just write that one over two to the n is geometric, where uh, a is one half and r is one half. So that implies that the sum of this thing, 1 over 2 to the n, must equal 1 half a over 1 minus r, which is coincidentally also 1 half. So that's just 1. So now I think we can get the sum of this thing in general, the whole thing. And that'll just be 3 over n times n plus 1 plus 1 over 2 to the n. So I'll use the first uh, part of my theorem and pull out the 3. Then I'll use the second one and rewrite these guys separately. So I get 3 times the 1 over n times n plus 1 series plus our geometric series 1 over 2 to the n. And I did that because we did this in example 8. And we saw that that series converged 1. So this is just 3 times 1 plus this guy we just calculated over here, which is 1. So that's just 4. So let's end on a uh, quick remark about um, adding a finite number of terms. If you have a uh, finite number of terms in a series, you can completely disregard them in terms of whether the series converges or diverges. Obviously, you would have to add them later, like when we did the example with the uh, repeating decimal. You can just look at the geometric part, see whether that converges or diverges, and then add the 2.3 later. So over here for this uh, series, if you wanted to, let's say you knew that starting at 4, it converged. So you could just worry about this stuff later. And because this thing converges, this entire series must, diver must converge. There's no way that adding a finite number of terms to any series could cause a series to suddenly explode off to infinity if it was converging to begin with. So we can generalize that a little bit by saying that whenever you have the sum of a series from 1 to infinity, and you know that the sum of, you know, uh, the other part of the series starting at some finite number going off to infinity, if you know that converges, then this over here is not an infinite series, it's finite number of terms. So that will have no effect on the convergence to divergence. It'll change the value of this, but if this thing converged, there's nothing, there's no finite number of terms you could add that would change that. The whole series will still have to converge.